Yeah. Så jeg kan lade den med. Så må du være til at lave den sådan her. Det er det, det er Okay, well, um, I think we've discovered something about Zoom. Ciao, hold on, you know, shoot all the... Yeah, you know, none of us have really used Zoom a lot, so um, it looks like all the rest of the demonstrations are going to be solos from here on out, uh, I guess, because yeah. Zoom doesn't like people talking over one another. Uh, so, unfortunately, so that was, uh, you know the jigsaw puzzle of uh, normally, you know, I'll send a YouTube link in the chat section here and you can, well, you can view a recording of that uh, wonderful uh, piece. Um, so we're just going to jump right into doing solo stuff uh, with the band here since that was a less than uh, ideal start. Um, we'll start with I and Ol. Um, so, you know, I, a lot of you guys are probably familiar with Tuvan music. I see some people's names that I recognize from, uh, you know, Tuvan uh, music groups on the internet. Um, so just bear with me if uh, some of this stuff is uh, stuff that uh, is already familiar to you because it might not be familiar to everybody and we want to get everyone um, on the same page here. So uh, Tuvan music, Tuvan vocal music or Tuvan throat singing is a way of using your voice to produce music that relies on using the natural fundamental nature of sound uh, to have a single singer create multiple uh, distinct uh, musical tones at the same time. But there's a lot of different ways of doing this. And what we hope to teach you over the course of this presentation is that uh, number one, the uh, not all throat singing is the same. There's a lot of different kinds of music that get called throat singing, and they belong to different cultures, to Tuva, to Mongolia, to the Inuit people, to the Kosa people in South Africa. And all of these different ways of using your voice are called throat singing in these sort of, uh, you know, modern musical parlance. But Tuvan throat singing is this entire art form that has its own specific uh, sound, its own specific musical theory that is built on uh, the sounds of nature and is built on something called overtones. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to show you several of the different uh, styles of Tuvan vocal music or Tuvan throat singing. And these are all different ways of using your voice to create music that you can think of it as a different instrument. So first we're going to start with Ian Ol, uh, who I hope is still in here. He's disappeared from the uh, thing. Ian Ol, what's up, Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So Ian Ol is going to start with uh, the, uh, what gets called Hume. We'd like to start with this because it sort of sits in the middle 
of all the styles. You can think of the three basic styles as low, medium, and high. And uh, we'll start with Ian Ole, and we'd just like you to listen for how he's able to achieve at the same time kind of a soft, medium tone that's a drone, but then you're gonna hear different overtones making melodies on top of that. And so after we listen to Ian Ole, um, and before we go to Ian, we'll talk a little bit about how that happens. So here's Ian Ole Sam showing us what we call in Tuva, who made. Um, so there's I thank you very much, I and all. Um, you know, I, I, a lot of you have probably been in Zoom stuff before. We haven't done it much. So for us as performers, it's, it's definitely an interesting feeling to sort of have this weird sort of mute, uh, you know, response. I know was just worried that nobody had heard him. Um, so that's that's Kume. And, you know, unfortunately, the automatic sort of sound, um, you know, the, the compression and stuff that's going on with Zoom kind of cuts it down a little bit. But um, uh, Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the great comments. Um, Kate had a question, Kate McGuire, and it actually leads into what we're going to talk about um, next. And uh, actually, some of these comments I haven't seen yet, because uh, we're going to move to Ian. Ian's going to share with us Sagut, which is the higher of the basic styles of Tuvan vocal music. And uh, for those of you who aren't looking in the chat window, Kate McGuire had a question about how to dampen the fundamental tone to let the high overtones through more clearly. Like what are the vocal mechanics? And this is a great question because it leads into what uh, Ian's gonna demonstrate for us with Sagut. Now, Sagut is the style of Tuvan uh, vocal music, the style of Tuvan throat singing that everybody wants to do right away because it's, it's really the one where, you know, it turns heads. It's really, you know, it's immediately obvious that this is something very special and it's also not immediately obvious that it's even a human voice. So this is something that's really attractive people and they want to do it. Um, but in order to be able to perform Sagut, you have to be able to do exactly what Kate is referring to here in this question of uh, how we dampen the fundamental tone and let the high overtones through more clearly is when a Tuvan musician performs, uh, they 
what they do, the key fundamental technique, uh, at least for Hume and Sagut, we're going to talk about Karkara in a second, is that you have to get some tension in the area of your vocal folds or your vocal cords. And what this does from a sonic perspective, if you're looking at this at a spectrogram, which shows us the intensity of sound at various frequencies, uh, normally when people are talking or singing, you have a lot of sound across a lot of frequencies. It's a, it's a big blend. And when Ayanol begins to perform Hume or when Ayan begins to perform Sugut, the first thing that they do is they make, they, they tense in uh, their, right at their vocal folds. And some people in Tuva refer to this as corrector, correct unu, uh, which means basically like a chest voice. And it's, it's an idea of you're not squeezing anything up here. You're just squeezing right here at your, at your vocal folds. And this can be something that's really hard for non-Tuvans to get because you're looking for a specific timbre. And it's really easy to uh, mess around with overtones with other parts of your face, which I'll talk about after we listen to Ayan. So the difference between Sagut, which Ayan is going to show us now, and, and Hume that Ayanol just showed us, is that Ayan, in addition to squeezing here at his vocal folds, um, Ayanol was manipulating the overtones with very subtle movements of the back of his tongue, uh, mostly, the, the, um, the epiglottis area, actually, and changing the size and shape of spaces in there. And Ayan's going to take that exact same technique and he's going to add something else. He's going to take the tip of his tongue and place it in a place called the alveolar ridge, which is this little ridge behind your upper uh, front teeth. And by doing that and making kind of an uh sound and simultaneously squeezing the sides of his tongue so they make contact with his teeth, he creates this really crazy... Um, space, a double, two spaces actually, that makes the fundamental note even quieter and really amplifies one of these overtone notes. So the very non-technical description of this is that overtones are notes that are naturally produced in any sound and they're a part of every sound. We don't normally hear them because the loudest part of most sounds that we hear is called the fundamental. For instance, when I play a piano key and that key, we call that note C. We call it C because that's the fundamental note that's coming out, it's the loudest sound. But these overtones come from the way things vibrate and normally they're all blended in there um, and we don't hear them separately. But what Tuvins are doing is they're actually sculpting, they're crafting sound so that you're removing parts of the sound and our ear can hear the overtone. So if Ian, if you're ready, um, I'd like to ask Ian to share with us this really wonderful filtration and amplification of a hidden note that was already there, we just never heard it. And so in Tuvan, we call this Sagut. Cha. <clears throat> <clears throat>
Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Th- thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. I am. Thank you. So comment on it. The zombies are also ramrupters. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody for the good comments and stuff. I'm glad to know that it's coming through. And uh, Gina, I hope uh, you're just muting everybody else while they sing too. I just saw that that might help with the audio, Doctor. So thanks for that. Um, we might have some cameos by my children. I just want to uh, let everybody know. It turned um, into Jello. Oh yeah, it did turn into Jello. Okay, I'm, I'm in the middle of a work thing. Um, so, uh, so I am sharing with us a good, and you know, even though some of the. Something. Not right now, honey. Okay, ask mama. Um, so uh, I, that's so good, and that's purifying. You know, for those of you that are string players and stuff like that, um, you know, there's a, a technique called flageolet where you uh, you place your finger softly on the guitar string uh, at the twelfth fret or the seventh or the fifth fret, and you get this nice pure sound. It's the pure tone. Um, but that's the same timbre that you get when you perform sagut. It's it's a very it's it's the timbre that happens when you're uh, producing a, a sound that's not the coming from the original fundamental vibration, uh, but rather from one of the uh, vibrations that was born on top of the fundamental vibration. So that's sagut. Um, and uh, oh, so that's that's sagut. Now with kargara, which body is going to show us next. Um, some of you, a lot of you, I mean, I, I know uh, for sure some of the people that I recognize are learning tube and throat singing. Some people have, uh, are actually doing quite well. Um, and when people are learning tube and music, there's kind of two paths that you can go down at first. And the first path leads towards Hume and Sagut, which uh, Ayan and Ayan Ol just showed us. And the second path leads you towards Kargara. Um, that's because the fundamental technique uh, at the base of these uh, vocal styles is a tiny bit different physically. Now, the, I, the scientifically, acoustically, the idea is still the same. You are still creating a fundamental sound and you're changing the size and shape of spaces inside of your mouth uh, or inside of your vocal uh, uh, tract, excuse me, which is not just your mouth, but it also includes the, the nose, of course, and your chest to manipulate the amount of overtones that are present and how they sound. This is all manipulating the timbre of the sound, which is hugely important in tuba music. With kume and sagut, the main fundamental physical technique that you wanna master is learning how to uh, create a little bit of tension at your vocal folds, like this, this chest voice that I talked about. Now with kargara, which is a little bit different, um, you learn to manipulate something called your false vocal folds, which anatomically, this is a set of muscles that lives on top of your regular vocal folds. And normally in our lives, they don't do much and we don't use them uh, consciously. I, I believe they're there to protect your, your vo- vocal folds, which some people call the voice box or the, uh, um, the vocal cords. But when we perform kargara, we add just a little bit of extra tension there, which gets those vocal folds also vibrating that creates a subtone, uh, a bass sound, which gives us a very deep and uh, rumbling sound. But at the same time, and I, I hope it comes over Zoom, um, uh, it should, you manipulate, this time it's a less subtle change. You make different vowel sounds with your mouth, like a, ah, a, o, oh, and you'll see body changing the articulations he's making with his mouth. And this will change the overtone note that he gets. Um, and so he's able to create a melody, which again, it has a, a constant drone, and that's the low part coming from the false vocal folds. And then he has peaks and valleys that he's gonna create that go on top of it. And you know, a lot of people talk about how this could almost be seen as a musical representation of looking at mountain peaks from afar, where you have you know, the low, low, you know, they're all connected to the same ground, but they create a contour against the sky and the space between those two lines, that's where the mountain is. So it's hard to do over Zoom, but hopefully we can get a sense of this where we hear the low tone, the high overtone melody, and then this creates a a real sense of space or volume uh, in this lowest style, which we call Kargara. Oh, 
dice we'll try to work on some kind of uh, yeah uh we're pretty inexperienced with Zoom, and so I don't know if it. Uh, I think there's probably an audio setting that you could do somewhere uh, that deals with background sound in terms of taking it out or not taking it out. I. This is honestly the first time that any of us here in Alash have done it. So um, I'd like to add that we will add some links. I'll send them to Gina, and she can send them to all the registered participants, um, just so you can get a you know. Um, uh, you know, a, a more nicely recorded version of some of the stuff that might be popping in and out here. So, but uh, thanks everybody for bearing with us on that. Um, as a matter of fact, why don't we try uh, turning to the instruments for a moment um, just to see if we can get some a little better body thing? You getting by the way? Okay. You getting better there, somebody? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so there was a bit of a question. Ah, good. Yeah, all right. Somebody says, go, if you don't see it in the chat there, go into settings audio and turn off the automatics adjustments. So uh, hopefully we can find that and um, maybe we can loop back to a couple more solo uh, Kume performances because we, we wanted to talk about some of the other styles um, that don't normally get discussed, uh, but we have some time to do that. Um, in the meantime, body He's getting his eagle ready, and um, while he gets the eagle ready, I wanted to ask or answer a question. Um, yeah, actually, the bass filter too. Yeah, the Zoom probably has a high pass filter going there, which which filters out low sounds. And uh, bodies Carter Rock can get down as low as forty hertz, um, which is a real, uh, really, really low note. Uh, that that Carter Rock was more probably about eighty five, but it's still pretty. You know, a lot of times for speech, they'll set the high pass about a hundred. Um, we had a question about how I got to Tuva, um, which I'm going to answer as Body gets his eagle ready. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, I'm from the United States. I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, um, living on a steady diet of beer brats and uh, Milwaukee Brewers baseball. Um, and all of that changed when I was about 20 years old, uh, 21. I heard Tuvan music for the first time from a legendary band called Hunhurtu, which uh, most of you who are fans of the music, I'm sure are familiar with. They're a band, in addition to our teacher, Kongarol, uh, that band and our teacher, Kongarol, were two of the main forces in introducing the world to tuba music in the 90s. And I heard that music back in 1999. Um, and I spent uh, many years, three years, uh, like a lot of you, trying to learn how to throat sing myself. Um, there was no material really available on the internet. Uh, there was some scattered people, uh, you know, and we had a little bit of a community and I, I learned from some folks, including a fellow who'd been to Tuba once before, 
uh, by the name of Steve Sklar, who's a, a wonderful American practitioner of this music. And I realized that uh, what I was doing was not enough and that this music is really powerful and important. Uh, it's very wrapped up in the identity of what it means to be a Tuvan. And I realized very quickly that I was messing with something that was extremely valuable and extremely intimately involved with a particular culture. And that if I was gonna perform this music, I didn't wanna just go waving it around like some Padawan in a, in, in a cantina with his lightsaber, you know, I wanted to really, really respect it and really, really learn everything I could and learn the language and be a, a worthy bearer of the tradition. And that inspired me to apply for a grant called the Fulbright Scholarship. Um, I got that in 2003. And when I got here, I ended up, I met Vadi, Ayan, and I and all the members of Alash uh, within my first week here. I also met the Tuvan National Orchestra within my first week here. Uh, I began learning from them. And then through some real big flukes, um, they needed a bass player on the bass Dosh Palur because uh, the, the previous guys who'd been playing it uh, were all unavailable. And I, I sort of jokingly suggested that uh, I could play uh, in the orchestra. I asked to sit in and they said, well, can you play the bass? And I said, yeah. But what I really meant was that I used to work in a guitar store. Um, so they let me in and uh, I ended up staying there, learning the music, uh, having the honor of being the only foreigner in the orchestra. And when my Fulbright year was over, I, I, I came back here as quickly as I could because I, um, I knew that I'd only really uh, you know, uh, broken the surface of what I had to learn uh, in terms of becoming a worthy representative of this music. So. Um, I stayed here, I, I met a beautiful young lady, and uh, we got married, and I, I got to tour with The Lash starting in 2006, and uh, we've kind of made a life of that ever since. So this is my 17th year in Tuva, and uh, just celebrating tonight is my 10th wedding anniversary, actually, uh, with my wife, and uh, sitting here in the house that we built here in Tuva, so thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Body now and uh, ask him to share a little bit of the Egil with us and hope that this will come through a little bit better. Um, now, you know, it's funny, we're having this discussion about Zoom thinking that Tuvan music is background noise. Well, you know, there's a lot of reasons for this. And, you know, I, I think one of the big ones is that Zoom was created by sound engineers for speech and Western music. And so it recognizes Western music, but Tuvan music, the whole idea with Tuvan music is that you're not trying to create these focused, concentrated notes, even with Sagut. Even though Sagut is a very pure tone, it still has other stuff going on there. And Tuvan music is much more about a rainbow of notes or a spectrum or sort of a spray of notes. And um, Body's going to show for us this very old, very traditional Tuvan instrument called the Egil, which has two strings, but each string is made out of many strands of horsehair. And this is important because each strand, they are all lined up parallel. And so a string might have anywhere from 60 to 120 strands and they're all vibrating separately. And they create a sound that's kind of dirty to our ears. And <clears throat> furthermore, when Body plays, he's gonna, he's gonna change the pressure and the angle of his fingers. And because the strings are not just one you know, wound string like we have on a violin, where you have one vibrating body, because they have all these different vibrating bodies, this gives him amazing, amazing control and subtlety uh, of varying what the sound sounds like. So you're going to hear a range of sounds from very pure single notes to sounds that are very scratchy and squeaky and poppy. And we're going to pray to the Zoom gods that they will all come through. So uh, this is Badi Dorju Ondar demonstrating the Tuvan Egil. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Ich gehe so oben zu gehen und aufdrehen, ja. So yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, I'm trying thank to catch up. Much. Yeah, you're welcome, buddy. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to catch up on all the uh, comments too. Uh, that was my wife just bringing me a piece of anniversary cake there. Um, but yeah, so you could hear the rainbow of sounds uh, as we mentioned here. Uh, opposite to the sitar, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, Greg, the thumb, right, some of you might have noticed, uh, you know, especially those of you guys that are th string players or whatever, you can see how body a lot of time was fingering both of the strings at the same time. And so the strings are tuned a fifth apart. Um, you know, traditionally in tuba, it didn't matter what note you were tuning, it, what mattered was the interval between the notes. So um, for instance, you know, body will often tune to D and A, uh, but it could be a C sharp and G sharp, or it could be C and G, you know, it depends on how you're feeling. It depends on your vocal range. You know, if you have a higher vocal range, if you're a kid, you can tune it higher, et cetera. So naturally they're a fifth apart. And so when you put your thumb, uh, when you put your thumb on what would be the equivalent of the seventh fret on a guitar string, that makes the two strings the same note when you play them. And so then, so you're, you're bringing the drone note up a fifth higher than what the bass string is. And then from here, your, um, you know, your fingers are going up and down the, the string. And then you can go up and you put your thumb on the 12th fret, which would make the bottom string one octave. So yeah, you have that uh, technique where you're fingering both strings. This is a great question, uh, Greg. Uh, Kate's got a question about uh, where timbral variation is. Uh, ah, yeah, Kate, you know, it's interesting. She, if, if you guys can't see this question in the chat, she's got a question about, uh, what parts of the composition are considered fixed and what are uh, open to the interview's creativity? Is it codified uh, that X part? No, no, yeah. See, there's no, like for instance, body was just playing, on the one side you could call it a composition uh, because it's a, it's a pretty common sort of melody uh, that you would play on the Egil um, that in Tuvan gets called Uzun Hoyuk. But every single performer is totally free to do their own variations of it and everybody kind of has their own sort of take on it. So, you know, partially this is also because the Tuvan tradition was never codified as a written, you know, tradition. So, you know, you don't have the problem that you might have with like Shashmakam or something like that, where it's, you know, there's this, or classical music, you know, where this is the composition and this is the way the composer intended it. Um, and so as a matter of fact, even nowadays, when you have musicians who are comfortable with Western music, uh, creating their own songs and composing for Tuvan music, there's not a lot of times, you know, when they will tell the singer, okay, yeah, we want you to do the third overtone here and the fifth overtone here. And as a matter of fact, when we've encountered Alash as a band, when we've encountered uh, composers who have been commissioned to write pieces um, and then they come in and they're trying to be like, okay, well, you know, we need you to do this overtone here and that overtone here and everything. Um, you know, especially when they're doing it in ways that are kind of unnatural to Tuvan music. Um, the, the band has been able to do it, but it's, it's difficult. Um, so yeah, the horse whinnied, uh, the scream, all that. So thank you very much, uh, body, uh, for that. Um, tuba music kind of has scales and modes. I mean, intervals are something that, uh, come from nature. 
Um, and, if, and if you listen to tuba music, it's all pretty much pentatonic. Uh, there's definitely a major and a minor mode that you have. Um, when you talk to the overtone, when you talk about the overtones, there are definitely certain overtones that are avoided. Um, I believe it's the, was it the 11th partial uh, that gets avoided? So yeah, that, that's definitely a thing. Um, Alash became a trio in uh, 2011. Uh, there was, yeah, we used to have four guys and one of the guys uh, decided to spend more time with his family. Uh, so he left the band. And then of course we come to a question that's very frequent about um, non, uh, about uh, female uh, throat singers and how you see men uh, more frequently than women. And, um, you know, that's, that's mostly because the tradition has primarily been practiced by men. Uh, if you dip into it historically though, um, there always have been women practicing the, the tradition. You have to understand that prior to uh, not too long ago, there was not really any such thing as like a full-time professional musician. Um, so many people performed throat singing, many people played music um, and, you know, not a, it was not a lot for audiences, you know, it, and so um, women, especially, you know, in some areas or in some families, it might have been considered sort of culturally awkward or whatever um, for women to perform throat singing, but it's, it's, a, it's a broad spectrum. You have some people will tell you, oh, it's bad and women shouldn't do it. And there's superstitions about women, you know, not being able to have children and stuff. And then you look at other families and they have women who have been throat singing and were encouraged by all the members of their families. For instance, um, the gentleman who used to be the fourth member of Alash, Nachin, his wife is uh, one of the best uh, throat singers of Tuva, she, male or female. And uh, as a matter of fact, Tuva has a title for the, it's the highest title that you can get as a Tuvan throat singer, which is called People's Hu Meiji of the Republic of Tuva. Tavaros Pulvin and Ustung Hu Meiji Body Dorju has this title, Ayanol has this title, but there's also two women who have this title as well. So it's certainly percentage wise, it's less often, but it's, uh, um, it's definitely something that's Papa, out there. Uh, where is like the phone folding thing? The what? Like the phone folding thing? I don't know. I don't know. I think maybe up on the balcony. If I look up on the balcony. I'll start running around up here. That's my, one of does twenty percent of my children, right there. Um, yeah. Where are you? I'm I'm right there. Yeah. Oh. Everyone says hi. They just can't hear or you can't hear them. Oh. Um, so I and all Sam has a homus. Let's see if he's still I and all Sam Bar the can we unmute I and all? I'm going to unmute him. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Um, great. Speaking of instruments, I'm going to turn it over to I and all to show us the Tuvan Homus. Um, you know, we touched on this idea of drones and overtones with the Igil and with the throat singing and stuff. And this instrument is one that's probably familiar to a lot of people because it's uh, found in many cultures throughout the world. But I really feel like it reaches a very, very uh, wonderful peak of uh, performance Papa, in tuba. Papa, and it's, a, it's an instrument that actually turns your body into a resonator. Uh, it's called the homus. So, uh, Ayano, Sam on uh, the homus. <clears throat> I'm <laughs> 
Thank you, I and all. It's I and all, Sam. So, yeah, yeah again, you know, <laughs> I'm going to go to the house. So, yeah, I'm going to go to the house. Yeah. You know, we have a little bit of, uh, you know, Zoom. I'm going to go to the house. Yeah, Jama, it's you get. I'm going to go to Zoom. Because you guys are going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. Yeah. Yeah, um, so yeah, that's, that's the homos. Um, I think, yeah, I've been trying to keep up with some of the uh, questions on the, uh, the comment feed, but I'd also like to maybe open it up now if anybody wants to come on uh, the video and ask a question uh, directly for the musicians. Um, and I can interpret um, just because I'm not sure that uh, the musicians are following the comment feed. So Gina, do you, does anybody uh, have, a, or anybody just write, I guess, on the uh, comment feed if you want to pose one of these questions uh, to one of the bands. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if anybody's got a question, just... Uh, Okay, great. Yeah, can we unmute Jessica Brown, and then we'll get to Ugo. Hello. I am not Jessica Brown, but... Oh, you're certainly not. <laughs> but, yeah, I wanted to ask uh, how you warm up the false vocal cords and, like, okay. get the other parts of your voice in order to sort of have, like, flexibility and not damage yourself, because I haven't okay. read anything about that. Yeah. Great. Bo manda aitre mande vaptra pa. Pelektel do kaya aitre vaptra. Langke bo kagra ka kiji kancha all them siyas kalaran kancha pelektel kancha ar pelektel ni yende kome deir ka tuska yende ka pelektel argalar bar be de aitre bar vaptra. Pelektel deir ka lam kondo la irbunju lam kal ganini na ma irbunju. Tırnaklara <gülüyor> <laughs> so yeah, the uh, you know the question is about warming up and you know especially for the false vocal folds, but just how to warm up for kume in general. And uh, you know what body is telling us is that basically you know when you're first starting to learn how to do this music, um, you know, you, you got to find those false vocal folds or you got to find, you know, the right way to squeeze those, you know, the vocal folds. And the thing that scares people is that, you know, it, it, with both of them, you know, you haven't used them in that way before. And so it'll tickle or cause you to cough pretty quickly. 
Um, but the key thing is that basically once you've found it, even if you can only hold it for a little bit, then you just kind of need to periodically come back to that sound that you found. So, you know, it, there's not really any, you know, it, it's, you know, it's not like back in choir where we also, you know, there's no like many mumbling mice, you know, that we used to sing or whatever, you know. Um, you just got to keep going back to that sound and doing it a little bit at a time. You know, once it starts to, you know, get a little painful, then you back off, have some water, rest the folds, rest your cords and come back to it. But the most important thing, even for people who are professional, who may performers, if they don't sing for a few days, you know, it, they can have a little trouble getting started. So it's just, you know, just to kind of lightly come back to it, but really, the best warm up and the best way to stay in shape is just to keep doing it. So, you know, the hard thing of course is to find the technique in the beginning, uh, you know, especially for non tuvan people who don't grow up listening to that sound in person. And honestly, a thing that I've experienced in my own sort of, you know, quest to learn this music as well as in helping a lash to teach these workshops is that it helps so much when you can physically be present with somebody too, because, you know, there's just something different about being in the same space and, and, sharing the same air and everything that really will help you uh, to reproduce that. Um, I see Hugo Castro has a question about Ezenguiler. Um, let's get him on here. Gina, yeah. if you could unmute Hugo. And uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so first of all, I would like to say hello to you, Sean, and to all Hi, the Hugo. last members. <laughs> Um, it's a very big honor for me to be able to hear you guys like this and to be able to speak to you like this. I love to listen to the music and it's an honor. Um, about the Zengiller, um, I know how to like uh, me mechanically, I know how, how it works. Uh, you open and close the vellum in your, in your throat. But uh, when I try to do that, especially while doing Sagat, uh, it's almost like uh, my, my tongue automatically goes to a position that likes make my voice full nasal and the, the sound stops okay. coming out of my throat and also the cigarette the cigarette stops so um do you have uh, like any tips or, or, or warm-ups or exercises i can do to, to be able to do a zingler okay great yeah so a zingler is uh one of the styles that we also wanted to talk about a little bit um you know, I know some people are starting to have to leave, but we would definitely touch on it. Maybe get a very short demonstration. Ezengiler comes from the Tuvan word ezengi, uh, which means stirrups. And so it's ezengiler kind of means doing the stirrup sound. And it involves a kind of interruption of your sound that creates this, and you can do it with, with different, uh, you can combine it with hume or with sagut or really even I guess you could combine it with Kargara even. Um, and it causes this interruption and also sort of this little ringing sound. And, and what it feels like is the sound that you would make when you're riding a horse and you're kind of bumping up and down and the handle of your whip is tapping or other metal bits are tapping on your stirrups, which are made of metal. And oftentimes, you know, traditionally in tuba, they would have a lot of silver in them, which has a nice ringing sound. So, um, you know, now Ugo's technical question here is about, you know, how can I incorporate that, especially when I'm doing sagut, which, you know, when you're doing sagut, you're already doing a lot of stuff. You're squeezing at your vocal folds. You've got your tongue stuck up against the roof of your mouth and stuff. And now you're trying to uh, open and close the velum, uh, which is basically what's happening when you're going. Nom, 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 nom. So I and all, then, uh, Anam sığıtla da köyme köymeyle da bolup çöp ne açtın bu koldu bu tumcukla az arasında örtür ol ağarını tutup bilir olup durur. Hı hı. Allah'ın sen tabirlat buna şu. Ol tumcuk. Hı hı. Tumcukla az arasında ol 
ağarını tutup salt bırara. All right, no, no, no. yeah. Yeah, the nada, the nada. So, uh, uh, Ugo, I, you may not even need a translation for that. Um, you know, the idea is just you're opening and closing the, the opening between your mouth and your nose. And, you, you know, you're cutting off the air between that. And so, you know, the thing is, when you've got a really good, comfortable sagut, even though it feels like there's a lot of things moving, you still should be able to block that vellum uh, uh, back and forth. And so you can see how INO was demonstrating uh, using that as Angulaire techniques with various vocal styles, you know, but it, you know, it's more or less, it's basically what happens when you go, um, 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 you know, when you make that um kind of sound, which is super important in tuba music. Um, we had a cool, um, a good question that I wanted to, to, uh, oh, where did that question go? Uh, somebody had a really, oh, about, uh, this one's for everybody. The question is about uh, combining Tuvan and American folk music. Um, and I just wanted to ask the band about that. Uh, Hanım cıldır, tayyiblar o da kolduğul, çanğız ol söz folklor deyirgeli tükücük durar olup durar. Kolduğul ol, arlar reyittim. Ol ol ayılganın podun çoru, ayılgaları tükücük durar olup durar ama. Tarcı ra. Hı hı, çeğde Allah, folklor bu oğun sonunda. Sals hukşum bazı şeylerin yanında taştır, şeylerin şeyle hukşum da hukşum da katçıyor, şeyle taştır. Yanında pentaton ko, zaten alt parçası. Mhm, mhm. O nolte zebo igil bide skrip ko, dosplur bide bazanca arasında bazı tevmey paynal bazı var ne de. Yeah, yeah, unduk unduk. Um, yeah, so you know our experience with American folk music, uh, you know. Folk music being folk music, the nice thing is that, you know, they tend to be starting in similar places, just being folk music, being people music, you know, from a strictly musical point of view, um, a lot of folk music, especially, you know, American uh, folk music, European folk music, you know, starts from a pentatonic place, which, you know, Tuvan music is certainly also very heavily pentatonic. You know, and you have similarities between stringed instruments like the banjo and the dashbalur, between the igil and the, the fiddle and stuff like that. So, you know, we certainly, we've had a couple of times when we've collaborated with folk musicians. I know we've got some Ithaca people out there and they've, they've heard us play with the horse flies before who, you know, are a band that, you know, is, was based in folk music, but of course takes it to a different direction. And a lot of people probably know that we've played with Bela Fleck and the Flecktones, which also certainly isn't classified as folk music, but he does play a banjo. Um, and then, you know, we've also had a, a really wonderful project that, um, We've, we've only had one concert with it and we were actually working on trying to get it back out there when all of this uh, happened uh, called Tuva Grass, um, which really it ended up being more like Tuva Old Time, uh, where we were working with an American folk musician, Andrew Sharon, um, and he got together a group uh, with a banjo player, an upright bass player, um, some very good old timey uh, singers, um, fiddlers, banjo players, um, and we did a concert at Joe's Pub in New York a couple of summers ago, and uh, it was great. You know, you know, we, we called it tuva grass because we were combining tuvan music and bluegrass. But what we really found is that the tuvan music tends to naturally fit more towards the type of American folk music that gets called old time, um, you know, rather than than bluegrass. You know, uh, tuvans aren't as, as much into shredding, um, you know, as the bluegrass guys are. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Um, 
it's getting a little late here in Tuva. Um, I'm happy to finish answering questions on chat and stuff. I don't know if maybe one, what do you think, Gina? Um, do we have any more guys, pressing questions? I know, I know it's late there. It's like what, 11, 11, 11 PM? It, it is 11, 11. Yes, well, it's, I mean, it's 11, yeah, 11. It's up to you guys. I see some people are asking about, <laughs> some people are asking about horses. Oh, sure. I don't know if you see the question from Nolan. Well, a horse is a four-legged animal. People <laughs> often ride it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, okay, Nolan. Yeah, let's let's get to Nolan's question, and then maybe uh, if anybody has one more question, just write it in the uh, comments, and I think we'll just kind of. Um, and again, um, you know, Gina will be sending out kind of a debriefing. I think to everyone that's registered, I'll get some links together uh, for you, so you can see some of this, some some links to what we demonstrated. And if anybody has any other um, questions that you didn't have a chance to. Um, but uh, you can you can ask it then. So, Bob, when they got to the water, after the way in the art, but the work of the water, art, hammer of the jubor, all the way in the cheat, I will appear in Bosom as well. I'm a terrible pudo arnos, I'm telling you, I put all the stairs now, Atıcılık <gülüyor> Yeah, Kadroska so yeah, you know, everybody's just uh, talking about how, um, you know, uh, the question was about the, uh, the relationship of horses to the music. Um, you know, horses are really the spirit that runs through the music and, and you know, this is because uh, horses have always been really important in the in the actual life of Tuvan people. Tuvan people uh, historically have been nomads, and in order to you know, being a nomad doesn't mean you're wandering around necessarily. It means you're moving around each season. You go to the same place you know each season. But in order to do this, uh, a horse is really really important and really necessary. Um, and you know, so in, if you listen to Tuvan songs, you know, for instance, if you want to express your love. Uh, for a woman, you're going to talk about a horse first, you know, and, and, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, Tuvan people always took really good care of their horses. There's lots of Tuvan proverbs that are connected with horses. Uh, you know, so many songs, as those of you who are fans of Tuvan music know, so many songs that, you know, they're either about horses or also things are viewed sort of through the prism of horses, you know, in terms of horses, you know, whether allegorically, metaphorically, you know, what have you. So that's, you know, just, it's, it's really, really important in Tuvan culture. As a matter of fact, if anyone's interested, you can contact me. Uh, I've translated an entire book uh, about the role of horses in Tuvan culture. And uh, you can get my email address from the organizers. And uh, I'm more than happy to share that uh, ebook. Uh, with you. Also, um, uh, I want to uh, I want to mention specifically to Greg Wilcox. I I, I I I have totally forgotten to hook you up with Body for lessons. I'll get on that right away. I know you've been waiting for Body. Um, and anybody else who's interested, um, again, you can get our contact info from the organizer. Um, Alash has been doing individual uh, Tuvan music lessons online. If anyone's interested in signing up for lessons. Um, you can uh, you can email us uh, and uh, get info about that. So um, yeah, just email information at the rotunda.org if you need anything uh, on that. Um, so from my end, uh, I believe everything's cool. Um, 
Stara je baš se stara, ja mogu da ostanem bis. Ja mi ga tu pomda, pistim ga pomda kurčle, da razumda, da keže, da leže u sam kup skot, slaž od prejdu, da za pajdan da. Yeah, um, we also just, you know, uh, Ayan just wants to make sure that we, you know, there's there's several people on this uh, meeting, like Scott and Busy uh, in Virginia, uh, Greg over there in Ithaca, Ugo down yeah. in Brazil. Um, if I see anybody else. <laughs> We really, really missed the rotunda as well. And uh, one fine day, we're going to get back there. So, you know, big, big tube and hugs from everybody at the uh, rotunda. Thank you, Sue. Yeah, <laughs> it's you, Sue, giving the clap there. The rotunda is great. If you don't know about them already, go and sign up for everything they do and, and hang out with them and be their friend. And, you know, just, just check it out because they're at their – for many, many years, they've been a really wonderful thing over there in Philadelphia. So, yeah, just, you know, thanks everybody for coming. Um, to those of you that we do know and to those who are our new friends, we're very grateful for your interest in tuning music. And, uh, you know, of course, thanks to Rotunda and, you know, thanks to Gina, Dustin, and Angus uh, for making this happen. Thank you all so much. This yeah, to this, to this, I would say if anybody wants to um, quickly unmute themselves just to say thank you vocally instead of typing it, if you want to, I would imagine the guys <laughs> that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. 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 It's good to see your faces again. <laughs> hey, Christian. Oh, hey, there you are. Yeah, good to see you too, man. Good to see you guys. Well, we miss Florida. Thank you. Uh, you got you to gotta come back to Tuva for some of this, Christian. So. <laughs> I know. I miss it. Is that the woodturner, Christian Burchard? And that is the woodturner, yes. The amazing woodturner, Christian Burchard. He's... He's one of the people on this Zoom who's been in my kitchen. <laughs> it's amazing that even though we're all in different time zones, uh, the whole world is connected here. So that's awesome. Is there a site to make donations? Uh, Gina might know something about that. Well, donations for the rotunda or for a lash? For both. Um, the best way to make a donation to the Honda is if you have PayPal. Actually, I'll just write it in the in the chat. If you PayPal um, information at therotunda.org, that's the best way. I don't know about a lash. Maybe buying CDs online or I, what what works for you? Guys? Yeah, you know, buying CDs, downloading, or also PayPal at lashensemble at gmail .com and you know, yeah, maybe we can include that in the in the. Um, a debriefing email too. If anyone wants to clunk a coin in the tip jar, we can put our respective PayPal's in there. Thank you, Jay. I like Jay's not dying. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so uh, much. Yeah, thank you for hosting us, Gina. It's great to see you, Christian. Great to see you, Scott, and Busy. Thanks. Nice to meet all the rest of you guys that are still on here. We hope yeah. hope we'll see you all soon in your hometowns. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Appreciate right. it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Bye. 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 Nice night. See you next time. See you. Yeah, see you next time. Yeah. <laughs>